In AD, year zero, the Roman army was by far the best in the world and rapidly expanding their empire's lands northward. Every soldier was well-trained and motivated. The average term of service in the Roman army was 25 years, during which time the soldier underwent heavy and lengthy training to be ready to face any enemy. At the same time, the Roman army had incredible discipline that even modern generals would envy. In order to maintain well-trained and obedient soldiers, it was necessary to introduce an extremely strict military law, which had to be obeyed by both ordinary and high ranks. This procedure was, above all, to make the legionnaires completely loyal to the commander. A soldier had to be more afraid of what might happen to him in a Roman camp for failing to fulfill a task than of being killed on the battlefield. For example, if he were not found at his post or asleep during a guard's inspection, he would be court-martialed the next day. In case of conviction, the court-martial touched the guilty person with a cane, and then the soldiers, mostly his fellow soldiers, beat him with sticks or threw stones at him. At the same time, a reward system was introduced to motivate soldiers to fight even better and sacrifice themselves. Legionnaires, at the end of service, were promised a plot of land and privileges, and in addition, every soldier in the Roman army had the hope of promotion because centurions were killed quite often, as they directly participated in the battles. And there was always a chance that an ordinary legionary showing bravery could take the place of his fallen commander. And centurions, as you know, were paid more than the average legionary, and they were given better armor. In addition, soldiers were deliberately placed far from home so that they did not sympathize with the local population. So, the legionnaire obeyed even the most inhumane and criminal orders of the commanding officer without question. But even when soldiers were not serving to maintain discipline, they were engaged in construction. Thus, they were often assigned the task of building roads and fortifications. Tired men have no time to rebel. Don't think that the Roman army relied on training and discipline alone. Roman armor and weapons were the best in the ancient world. For example, the main uniform of legionaries was a helmet galea, which was designed for almost complete protection of the head. No other army of the period could boast of such helmets, and the body of legionnaires was mostly protected by lorica hamata, ring armor, or lorica segmentata, plate armor. The second, according to some sources, appeared just after the Roman Empire began to fight with the Germanic tribes, which easily pierced the ring armor with spears and a thin tip, Fremia, and Lorica Segmentata fared much better in protecting the body from such weapons. Roman warriors, by the way, also used a similar spear, Pilum, perhaps also inspired by the weapons of the northern tribes, but they improved it by making the tip much longer. Like the Germanic tribes, the Romans used Pilum both for throwing and for stabbing the enemy. The secondary weapons of Roman legionaries were Gladius, short sword, and Spatha, long sword, which together with the shield scutum made the Roman soldier almost invulnerable to the barbarians. And a cohesive legion of such soldiers looked to the savage tribes like an armored war machine. And during the time of Julius Caesar, and later his successor Caesar Augustus, it seemed that the expansion of the Roman Empire could not be stopped. The Roman Empire occupied region after region until they crossed the Rhine River and met worthy opponents. In the forest beyond the river, there was a battle that was an embarrassment to the Roman Empire and turned the course of history. Within four days, the Germanic tribes destroyed three Roman legions and stopped the advance of Rome east of the Rhine River. And the heads of Roman legionnaires and centurions were hung on trees by the barbarians as a sign of victory over the Roman army. In history, this battle went down as the most crushing defeat of Rome. Julius Caesar's conquest of Gallia in the mid-first century BC divided the predominantly Celtic tribes into Romanized provinces and free Germanic tribes with the Rhine River as a natural border. In the winter of 17 or 16 BC, the Legion V. Alaude lost its standard eagle during battles with the Germanic tribe Sicambri. Each legion wore the standard as an embodiment of the Roman spirits, Losing it was the ultimate dishonor. Because of this loss, Caesar Augustus realized the need to subdue the Germanic region. He spent the next four years increasing Rome's military presence on the Rhine River border and immediately sent his adopted son Drusus to subdue Germania. In 12 BC, Drusus led an army on a campaign to defeat the Sicambrian tribes and other North Germanic tribes. 
he forced the tribes to surrender, and some sources suggest that he recovered the lost eagle standard. Drusus then sent his legions into the dense forest east of the Rhine, where he built a fort and spent the winter successfully pacifying the region. In the following years, he advanced as far as the Elbe River in eastern present-day Germany. Up until he died in 9 BC, Drusus subjugated a vast swath of territory and tribes that the Romans collectively called Germania. After Drusus's death, his brother Tiberius took command of the troops in the unoccupied territory, and the region remained relatively calm until one decision by Emperor Augustus. He decided to tax the entire new acquired territory, which did not please the freedom-loving and very warlike Germans. The responsibilities of the governor of the Germanic provinces were performed by Publius Quintilius Vadis, and under his command, there were three legions. He collected taxes at the behest of Augustus, but this attempt to Romanize the provinces incurred anger among the tribes. However, there is no consensus among the disparate and perpetually warring Germanic tribes. So although Romanization and taxes did not suit them, the tribes could not gather in a large army to drive the Roman invaders out of their land. But all that was changed by Arminius. Arminius was the son of the Cheruscan chieftain, Segimerus. As children, the young prince and his brother Flavus had been taken hostage by the Romans to ensure their father's obedience. While in captivity, Arminius learned Latin, became a Roman citizen, and made a successful career in the Roman army, serving as commander of the supporting cavalry. But despite his childhood in Rome and his status as a Roman citizen, Arminius was loyal to his tribe, and in his mind, he always had the idea of rebellion and liberation of his native land from the Romans. He returned to northern Germany in 7 or 8 AD, where the Roman Empire had established firm control over the territories east of the Rhine, along the rivers Lip and Main, and was now seeking to extend its hegemony eastward. Arminius began plotting to unite the various Germanic tribes to thwart Roman attempts to incorporate their lands into the empire. This proved to be a difficult task, as the tribes were very independent, and many of them had traditionally been each other's enemies. Between 6 and 9 AD, the Romans were forced to move eight of the eleven legions stationed in Germany east of the Rhine to quell a revolt in the Balkans, leaving Varus with only three legions to confront the Germans. Arminius saw this as the perfect opportunity to defeat Varus. He earned the trust of the Roman commander, who was unaware that Arminius had switched sides with his Germanic tribe. He deceived the commander by telling him about a fake rebellion, causing Varus to move to suppress it. But Arminius was preparing an ambush in the meantime. He knew the military tactics of the Romans very well. As commander during the violent Illyrian Revolt, 6 to 9 AD, Arminius had noticed the vulnerabilities in the Roman legions. In some cases, the wild Illyrians were close to winning battles against the Romans, especially in the swamps, hills, and woodlands that hindered the superiority of the Roman army. Arminius decided to use the equally difficult terrain, which was plentiful in Germany against the Romans. He knew that the greatest strength of the Roman legionaries was their ability to fight as a unit. So, he decided to lead the Roman legions into swampy, wooded, and narrow terrain, where their cohesion would be lost. Their marching column numbered about 20,000 men and was 7 to 8 miles long, although some sources gave a figure of even 10 to 12 miles. On the first day, Arminius and his supporting troops moved away from the Roman column, supposedly to do reconnaissance and recruit additional troops and Varius did not doubt Arminius' words, which he soon came to regret. The rain started to fall early on the second day of the march, becoming increasingly heavy. The legionaries struggled against the pouring rain and the whipping wind as they trudged forward through mud that made the wagons barely crawl. In addition to the rain, a strong wind picked up, and according to the Roman historian Cassius Dio, treetops snapped, falling on the column. Bracing against the elements, the legionaries continued their arduous march. Entering a narrow passage between two sections of the Teutoburg forest, the unsuspecting, very tired Romans never saw the carefully laid trap and helplessly fell into it. Surrounded on all sides by barbarians, the legions descended into chaos. The Germanian warriors pelted the Romans with spears and flaming arrows. The column was surrounded and turning back the legionaries was simply not possible. The Germans were most likely trying, first of all, to inflict maximum damage to the cavalry and the Romans' convoy crammed on the narrow forest road. But the battle-hardened centurions restored order in the column, gathering the nearest legionnaires and leading counterattacks to break forward. 
After a fierce battle, the first attacks of the Germans were repelled, and the Romans even managed to set up a fortified night camp on a nearby hill. While the legionaries erected barricades, the last of the Roman units fought their way out of the forest towards the main column. But the Roman transport was badly damaged, and they had only two days of supplies left. So the next morning, Varus decided to go west to the network of Roman military camps. For the next two days, the colony kept moving, fending off attacks from the Germanic tribes. But now, the Romans were better prepared for battle, and they marched on flat terrain so the losses among them were already much less than on the first day of the battle. And the Romans even had hope that they could get to the military camp and would be safe. But soon, another ambush awaited them. On the third day of the battle, the legions approached the hill Calcrise, and they could only go through a narrow road stretching between the hill and the swampy area. The incessant rains washed out the dirt road, and it wasn't easy to traverse. It was hard to think of a more ideal place for an ambush, but that wasn't all. During excavations at the end of the 20th century, archaeologists found out that the Germans had built an earthen wall near the hill in advance, which gave the attackers the opportunity to attack the Roman column from it and significantly constricted the already narrow and difficult to pass road. The Roman column had no other way out and had to follow the road, which for most of them would be their last. As the column approached the earthen wall, Arminius and the bulk of his German troops attacked the Romans again. The barbarians showered the legionnaires with a ceaseless stream of throwing spears and arrows. Most of the Romans hid behind their shields, while some cohorts, unwilling to remain passive targets, charged at the German positions. Most of these unsupported attacks were easily repelled. Others broke through but were shot down by the thousands of Germans waiting behind the earthen wall. The Romans were trapped and all attempts to storm this wall proved futile. The most senior officer, Pneumonius Valla, abandoned the troops and deserted with the cavalry. However, his retreat was in vain as he was overtaken by the Germans and killed shortly afterwards. The Germanic warriors then went on the attack against the already exhausted legionnaires and slaughtered the disintegrating Roman forces. At this point, neither plate armor nor the best helmets for their time could save the Romans. Sandwiched between a wall and the swamp, the Roman army was paralyzed and communication between cohorts was cut, giving the Germanic army an even greater advantage. Arminius unleashed numerous throngs of his warriors upon the trembling legions. Throughout these three days of battle, German losses were likely greater than Roman losses, but they were constantly receiving reinforcements, whereas the Romans were still hundreds of miles from their fortresses. Although different sources describe the Germanic losses differently, some say that compared to the Roman losses, 15,000 to 20,000 soldiers, the Germanic losses were much smaller. The remnants of the Roman column, which managed to break through, retreated to the west and camped on a nearby hill for the night. Having no strength to fortify their camp, the legionaries fell into utter despair. They no longer had any chance of escape. On the fourth day, they were again ambushed in a forested area, and by noon it was all over. Varus could not live with his disgrace. Other commanders either surrendered or followed Varus' example. After four days of continuous fighting, the Germans had wiped out three legions. The Roman survivors were tortured before being sacrificed to the gods. Their heads were pinned to trees and their skulls were taken home as souvenirs. Although different sources describe what happened in the Teutoburg Forest differently, the result of this battle was basically the same the complete defeat of the Roman army and the loss of control over the territories east of the Rhine River. The freedom-loving and warlike tribes of Germania drove out of the seemingly invincible Roman army and shattered its reputation in the eyes of the entire ancient world. Rome's previously successful wars of conquest had steadily inflated the empire's sense of superiority over neighboring powers, especially in northern and central Europe. The tragedy at Teutoburg Forest instilled fear in the hearts of the Romans. The historian Suetonius writes that Emperor Augustus, as a sign of mourning, did not cut his beard and hair for months, and often wailed, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. Tiberius conducted three successive campaigns against the Germanic tribes, but chose not to occupy their lands east of the Rhine. Instead, he deployed at least eight legions along the border to protect the provinces of eastern Gallia from Germanic invasion. In the fall of AD 14, a Roman general named Germanicus led a vengeful campaign into Germany in search of the fallen legions. 
He hit every spot where Varus's column had been attacked, and buried the remains of the dead in the Teutoburg forest at Varus' final resting place. Germanicus subdued several nearby tribes and recovered at least one standard. By 16 AD, he had recaptured the Lip Valley and much of the North Sea coast. However, Tiberius, now emperor, again decided not to subject the area to Roman rule, instead hoping that the Germanicus campaign would serve as a warning. During the unification of Germany in the 19th century, Arminius became a symbol of German freedom. Although largely forgotten in West Germany after World War II, Arminius was celebrated in East Germany as a revolutionary leader who united the proletarian Germanic tribes against Roman rule. And the Battle of Teutoburg Forest is still considered the most important defeat in Roman history, ending the triumphant period of Roman expansion. How do you think the world might have turned out if the Romans had won this battle? Share your opinion in the comments, and we'd love to know your opinion. And if you liked the video, do not forget to give us a like and subscribe to the channel. There are a lot of interesting things waiting for you. If you want to support the channel financially, the link to our Patreon page is in the description. See you later!